everybody. Uh, this time the talk will be on smart coalitions and next to me is Raymond Behrens. Raymond is the Global Vice President of Cybersecurity at ATOS and next to Raymond is Dave Merkel. Uh, he is the Chief Technology Officer of FireEye. Now both of you have more than 15 years of experience, you in cybersecurity and incident response and Raymond you in defense and advice. And my first ask, my question to you is, have you seen a lot of changes in smart coalitions over the next, the, the last 15 years? Raymond, would you answer first? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, especially in defense, it, it's where you're seeing NATO take a very prominent role in, in organizations, connecting organizations. And actually, uh, NATO started, I think, a couple of years ago with a concept they call smart defense. This was not initially meant for cybersecurity, but now transversed into cybersecurity where the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, so the, the, the smaller countries in the NATO environment are actually working together to build capabilities. So that's efficient, it saves money, but it also shares knowledge and it brings countries to an, to an equal level of understanding. So that's starting in the defense domain. In the civil world, that's now becoming more and more common as well. You see uh, private industry connecting to governments, you see governments connecting to other governments. And I think that process is, is, is a first step. It is a necessary step to actually make sure there is a common understanding because that's, in my opinion, the biggest challenge. I mean, if I just look at cybersecurity, mm -hmm. I mean, there is not a definition, an agreed definition of what cybersecurity really is. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that if we are faced with clients, that we spend the first 30, 30 minutes actually finding out what they actually mean with that because every country, every organization means something different just talking about cybersecurity. So smart coalitions, I think, is a necessary step to actually reach a next level of maturity. Yeah, have yeah, you I, seen big changes over the years? I, I definitely have. Um, I think Raymond has a, a much better global perspective than I do based on his background, but, but speaking a little bit on what I've seen in the United States market, uh, it really started for us in the early 2000s with the defense industrial base where uh, our defense industry was pushed by government uh, to cooperate. It was just mandated as part of uh, the contractual language that they used to drive how they would purchase um, uh, weaponry and everything else from these defense contractors. And they actually built a very effective working group that caused sharing both between the defense industry and the government and then amongst peers. You, you could actually you know, go to a conference, watch two analysts from two different defense companies show up, go off in a corner and actually talk about breaches and what was going on and, and share intelligence. Um, we've seen some other industries in the U.S. start to do that. Uh, financial services is probably the furthest along in, in our particular market. Uh, and we are starting to see a little bit more reaching out across country boundaries. Um, I think there were some presentations even here uh, this week talking about different ISACs in different countries trying to form some coalitions to, to build that, that concept of global defense communities so that any one organization isn't really left standing alone in the face of, of the various threats that it faces. Yes. Now, I think the biggest change is that uh, there is a different form of leadership necessary because you're m working in a more uh, network-like structure. Mm -hmm. um, there's less hierarchy. Um, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit on what changes in leadership are necessary to achieve a safer cybersecurity world? And do you then mean leadership as on a governmental national level or on within an, on sea level within the boardroom? Uh, both. I mean in the government, so in the in the public sector, but also in the private sector. Okay, so let me then begin with the private sector. I think what we see generically is that it is being brought up to the boardroom, but as we've seen in this some of the presentations presented earlier as well. It is, it is still for many companies a business decision. It is, they see it as spending money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, and, and Dave mentioned that in his speech uh, as well, I mean, you need to look at it more from a defense in depth perspective, looking at who is your potential enemy, your competitor, and, and what do I need to do as a result of that. The other thing I see within private industry is that they are uh, sort of finding the balance between where does private industry begin and where does government take over. Uh, and for example, where you see that very prominently is around discussions in, in many countries around the world at the moment, 
where they are actually talking around how do we deal with critical national infrastructure. And you see a big uh, discussion currently ongoing between do we need to look at, do we need to type a point to organizations as being a critical national infrastructure organization, mm -hmm. for example, a bank, or do we say, no, no, within the bank there is a critical process which needs security and government involvement, but if they suffer the DDoS, well, that's, it's their website. It's not a government thing to support that. That balance is being found, and I think that requires leadership on both ends, but also from governments saying, well, this is the line, this is where I support, and this is where it just becomes a criminal offense, and I can step in, but I'm not your additional layer of security. So not only knowledge and commitment, but also clear roles and yeah. responsibilities. Yeah. Do you see any missing links in leadership that could bring us forward? Uh, I'll, I'll address it from a slightly, uh, a slightly uh, different angle. Um, and, and I'm going to tie it back to your initial question on smart coalitions. Yeah. Um, when I think about um, effective leadership, particularly when you're trying to form um, security defense communities, I have run into organizations that, that might sit there and say, why doesn't somebody do something? And my response to them is to look at them directly and say, well, I don't know, why don't you do something? Um, sometimes um, an effective way to increase your security posture and to uh, have a better view in what's happening in the threat environment is to go find your peers yourself. If there's not some industry working group, why don't you form a local working group with like-minded individuals? Uh, why don't you reach out? and contact those folks and build some trust-based relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't direct that a group forms, but you can go out and try to build some personal connections that ultimately can become the nucleus for a broader set of people beginning to get together uh, to help each other in a slightly broader scale. Okay. So while I, I absolutely agree with everything Raymond's talking about in terms of opportunities at a larger scale, I think um, a lot of groups could potentially, or a lot of companies may hobble themselves waiting for that to happen uh, when they could be taking some, some direct action on their own. Smaller scale, but still effective. Yeah. And proactive is what I hear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Chris. Uh, we've now been talking about uh, defense capabilities, and I can imagine that uh, people are willing to collaborate on that. But how about offense? Uh, in your presentation mm. uh, uh, yesterday, uh, this, this great metaphor that you see, you see in a very old airplane, you say, well, nobody thought then that this could be used for war. Now, in cyber, uh, Many countries, including in the West, are now building up cyber capability for offense capabilities. What kind of developments do you see in that area? It's a good question. Uh, are you not uh, allowed uh, to say anything well, on that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I think what we see generically is that this, and, and this is, an, is a fair legal, uh, uh, legal point to start, is where does offense, defense, and what you now hear, proactive defense, uh, start and end. Uh, and, and what you see a lot, and, and that's, that's how we try to, to, to initiate that kind of discussions, is if you would go into a store and you would take out a suit which has those blue ink things on it, and you go back home and you try to take it off and it spoils the suit mm -hmm. because you didn't do it. Is that then something which is wrong from the manufacturer point of view or from the store point of view? Well, everybody would say no. So if you would attack me on cyber and I would give you something back which would destroy your computer, is it then offense or is this proactive defense? So that's a very fair discussion you have. Well, that's a metaphor, but technically? You mean if you DDoS, you DDoS back or you, you install malware, you get malware back? No, if you or? try to take intellectual property from an organization who spent millions on R&D and they create a fake server which has R&D on it, but it's not really R&D, but it, it gives you something back because you download the zip file and within the zip file there's uh, something in there. I mean, that's, that's technically not even very difficult. Um, I think that's there where the legal discussion begins, where does offense and defense and then in the middle proactive defense end. Uh, Dave, well, when offense becomes defense? and when defense becomes offense. Uh, I, I have a pretty conservative view on this. Um, you know, let's, let's take an example of what was likely a government-sponsored activity, Stuxnet. You know, the government a government, go read the papers, decide which one you think it was, engaged in, in uh, what is uh, unquestionably offensive activity with a cyber weapon. Uh, but it, that, that weapon then very quickly 
became very public knowledge, and the techniques and capabilities inside of that weapon are very broadly exposed and now known on the internet. Now, it was put together in a way where its effect was contained to the actual target, but, but what about an offensive situation where you make a mistake? And now, as opposed to, uh, I like uh, Raymond's metaphor about the tag that ruins your suit when you take it out of the store. Uh, pre you could, it's gonna ruin your suit and maybe the thing you said on top of it. Um, if you make a mistake in a cyber response, because you know, technology is great at you know, just kind of cutting loose and, and scaling, you make a mistake, you could have a much broader impact that actually hits the attacker and 16 innocent bystanders. So I think there's a very serious risk, particularly for private organizations, and governments are going to do what they're going to do, but for private organizations to start thinking too much about how they're going to reach out beyond their own perimeter, um, I agree there's a ton of legal questions, and I think there's some practical questions about how capable private organizations actually are to do that responsibly. My assessment is not very. So uh, in, in a way, we are uh, pulling up a digital barbed wire, and we're not going to shoot them. Uh, I, I think, uh, again, my personal view is I think that's, that's where we are right now. Certainly there's a lot of people thinking about trying to reach past that fence, but um, um, co color me a little bit skeptical about how, how effective it will be. Raymond, you may have a different opinion. Yeah, well, I, I think um, organizations are trying to pull up the barbed wire. Uh, and I think there, and this morning session actually showed that uh, it's around security equaling control. Uh, and, and security becomes more and more difficult to remain in control. Uh, and that, that's what we shown in our presentation as well. If you look at what people are doing with their own device, I mean, this is making it very difficult in general. Um, and and that, that's, that's, I think, one of the main problems. Where do you deal with privacy? And, and I mean, in order to be offensive or defensive, I think the, it starts with knowing something about your enemy but also knowing what you have within your own server, within your own organization. And I think that becomes increasingly more difficult for organizations to deal with. And then if you don't, are not able to deal with it, it is unable to protect it against. Clearly, having good smart coalitions uh, depends very much on uh, what the law allows us to do and the consequences of it. Um, I was wondering if you have any examples of the bad guys having smart coalitions because I, I'm convinced that um, there are a lot of coalitions going on and they're probably looking at us struggling sure. with having smart coalitions. Do you have any? Um, I have a couple of examples. We, we certainly have tracked various advanced threat groups and seen at times uh, more than one active in a single environment. So a give, given victim, uh, maybe some set of one particular group targets a certain set of information, some set targets another. Both appear to be very cling clearly linked mm -hmm. to perhaps a nation state's interests, but there are different teams focusing on different aspects working in some kind of coordinated effort. So we, we absolutely have seen that kind of activity. And there's, there's no question we see a propagation of capabilities from more advanced actors down to less advanced actors. Mm -hmm. Now how much of that is a smart coalition and how much of that is, gee, it sure is easy to copy your techniques because they're just bits and copying stuff is free. Uh, hard, hard to say, uh, hard to say. Uh, certainly in criminal enterprise, uh, plenty uh, of coalitions between them, uh, you know, exchanging techniques, working te uh, together for uh, mutual profit. Um, there are plenty of examples of that in particularly organized crime syndicates. Um, yeah, it, do I think it's extremely well structured? If it's not a nation state, probably not. It's probably a little chaotic. If it is a nation state, it's probably extremely structured and very deliberate. Do you have to add any examples to that, or? No, I think the, the most challenging thing we see is that the, uh, is around what, what you call the bad guy. Uh, and especially the, the quick change when a, a, a good guy becomes a bad guy yeah. is, is instant. And, and, and in every project we do as a company, who has security in front, you start with, like Dave explained yesterday, we start with a threat assessment. Who's your most likely threat? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at the Middle East, governments are changing at, at a certain time during the Arab Spring every month. So that means that a government who was very friendly suddenly can become totally different. 
and that means the means they bring in uh, are changed within a day. The, the means stay the same, but the way they use it yeah. are totally the opposite. What you describe is that the world around us is getting more and more complex and uh, my question is, um, what are the opportunities? Where are the opportunities to make quick progress? What would you advise government or private sector, any of them, what would be the priorities uh, within the context of smart uh, coalitions? Want me to start? I'll start. Okay. Um, well, uh, uh, if I'm talking to private organizations, I, I start first with the, with the practical. And the practical is um, just accepting the new normal, the fact that it is a more complicated environment. Um, organizations will be attacked, unlike the late 90s. It's not some kid in his mom's basement. It's a professional organization. Somebody's getting paid. They do want to steal what you're, you're currently doing for their own personal benefit or the benefit of some large organization or nation state. And, and getting that understanding to move up through the organization, up to and including the CEO and the board, I think is really important. Um, an interesting statistic, if you look at the average tenure of a CISO, at least in the US market, it's between 16 and 18 months. Why is that? It's because the first time there's a problem or a perceived issue, the CISO is getting, is getting fired. Well, when that happens in an organization, maybe that's deserved, or maybe that organization doesn't understand the problem yet because they're taking a CISO that just managed a very difficult problem like a breach, getting rid of them when what they built up was tremendous expertise and tremendous knowledge, trying to fight this threat and, and learn that it's the new normal and come up with strategies that are effective in dealing with it. Uh, so, so I'd start first with that practical advice, uh, and then I would move out and say, uh, while I do think there may be some interesting larger scope things government and industry as a whole should do, and Raymond probably has some good thoughts on that, it, sitting and waiting for that is probably not the right answer. You need to get involved, even if it's at a small scale, uh, in, in order to, to protect yourself and your organization's interests. But I hear you say that the boardroom support, knowledge and support from the boardroom is where it all starts. I, I think that's where it needs to get to. Uh, and there are some things out there helping uh, that could help CISOs really drive that message home. It go, there's uh, major stories in US papers about companies where in the face of a breach, everyone from the CISO to the CEO is fired, and some board members may actually be ejected from the organization. It's a relevant topic today. Go start the conversation and start some education. Make it personal. That's what I hear. I think that's very effective. Raymond. The first thing which comes to mind for me is, is uh, it's a paradigm shift and one of the, the, the key things in, in their thinking is that it starts with borderless thinking. Yeah. As long as countries, governments, but also private industry keeps thinking in, within the boundaries they think they are, mm. then it, it, it will never happen. Mm -hmm. And if you see the, the, the debates currently going on within the United Nations, within OVSE, um, you can actually compare them to, for example, an, an a discussion on global warming. It is such a difficult, as long as you have CO2 trade emissions, it is not a trade, it is a global problem. Uh, and, and, and in the presentation, we compared it with a flu virus that doesn't look at the border. It, it travels across borders and, and cyber is pretty much the same. So as long as we start dealing with our own regulations, our own restrictions, our own special privacies for a nation, it, it will never work. So, Raymond, where do you draw the borders in uh, knowledge sharing? You just mentioned uh, good guys can turn bad, but there's all, all, a lot of bad guys turning yeah. good, you know, especially in pen testing, hackers who feel remorse, want to do something good. Well, if you're a government, you can't hire somebody with a criminal record. But these guys have a lot of skills, a lot of knowledge. How do you tap into that knowledge? Uh, perhaps you can hire them, but you can use their software. Uh, what kinds of means do you have to tap into the smart coalitions of, well, the gray side, let's say that? I wouldn't say in every government stays away from hiring the bad guy, by the way, or the criminal okay. guy. <laughs> uh, right. I, I think there are some which you can find in some regions around the world where they do the opposite. Um, I think it is um, in the end 
the problem with cybersecurity, and I think Stuxnet is, is a good example, uh, it depends on the purpose. And the criminal taking away IP, selling that on the black market. Uh, I actually just wrote a, a little paper within Atos where I compared the great train robbery in the UK to somebody doing a cyber crime into a bank at the moment. If you look at how the police is looking at bank robberies, the problem is not preventing the bank robber getting into the vault, into the safe, because he will get in. The problem is he will get something out, and then he will start spending it. The majority of bank robbers is found by their yeah, driving an expensive car, buying a second home, which is uncommon. Um, so I think that's where uh, we need to look into for cybersecurity as well. If, if we see an organization being basically ransom because they've taken something out. You need to sell it, you need to get money in. Uh, so that part works. If you then go into the more destructive elements like Stuxnet, uh, and you can still debate whether cyber is destructive or only delaying, because that's an ongoing debate. But e even there, uh, the amount of money being spent on developing that is huge. Uh, there are not many nations even who are capable of having the right people having the enough funds to actually do that. So for us, we're saying, well, if you look into that part, the destructive part, there are not too many around. The biggest danger, and that's pretty similar to what we've seen in the Cold War, is not a country building the bomb. No, it's a country buying the bomb. Right. And that's, I think, the biggest fear. It's not Stuxnet. It's somebody from a criminal organization buying Stuxnet or part of Stuxnet and reusing that for a criminal purpose, and then it becomes worrying. Okay, Raymond and Dave, I'd like to thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, it is very clear that we're all on a journey and we haven't arrived yet, but thank you for making clear where the uh, capabilities are and the possibilities uh, to work on a safer cyber world. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks okay. for having us. Okay. Thanks, okay. Guys. Thanks.